Hello and thank you very much for tuning in to the podcast series by the New Silk Road Project. I'm your host today, Charles Stevens, the founder of the New Silk Road Project. This series is dedicated to understanding and raising awareness of one of the most important development strategies of the 21st century, China's Belt and Road Initiative. The centerpiece of the New Silk Road Project, an initiative supported by Jeep, CSIS, Magellan Capital, the University of St. Andrews and Dennis Shirah, was to travel the course of the Silk Road Economic Belt from London to Yiwu in eastern China, interviewing the key actors and academics along its course. We will have to apologise in advance for some of the tangential moments in this podcast series and also the variable quality of audio footage. We do hope this series sheds important light into China's growing global presence and the significant changes taking place across Eurasia. Before we left Georgia, we visited the city of love, Signagi, overlooking Azerbaijan in the east. Here we visited our friend, Paul Rodzianko. Very little of our discussion focused on China, but this very fact served as a reminder that in the same way we are reactive to what China does as it moves towards the centre, we must also be aware and receptive to the great complexity of movement in the world globally. Well, it's a pleasure having you all here. Um, interesting, wide-ranging conversation from uh, serious to less serious topics, including a few new games. But um, uh, on a more serious basis, I think the short answer to what you want to know is that uh, I'm a compulsive serial entrepreneur, and I prefer functioning one way or another in the international arena, which uh, over the last uh, 20 years has taken me uh, to do a lot of business in uh, Russia and Kazakhstan, and, um, uh, and uh, most recently last uh, 10 years in Georgia as well. So, so I, I'd say that uh, it's been a very exciting uh, period of time to be working in a part of the world that's evolving so rapidly. And not to mention the fact that uh, uh, some of the projects that I've been involved in in this space also relate to some developments uh, both in the U.S. and in Scandinavia for companies that I've been involved with. And how do business practices and cultures differ between your, 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 areas, of, your areas of interest? <laughs> Um, I think uh, one could also that answer that in the negative is how do they not how can they not differ? First of all, you've got uh, deep cultural uh, habits and imprints and uh, on each national group or national characteristic. Second of all, you have uh, recent history, for instance, the presence of the Soviet Union for so many years in the uh, what used to be the space of the Soviet Union has also has overlain many of the natural characteristics that the people in those countries have had. Um, either way, one just has to pay attention to detail, one has to listen to uh, trusted advisors and um, hope that you get it right. And above all, treat each, each country and each person that you deal with in that country with the appropriate respect. And usually that yields pretty good results. And I know one of your business interests, Kafka's, Kafka's Cement, uh, has dealt with the EBRD in, in, in a certain venture, a venture involving a Chinese steel, steel or cement mill. Um, would you be happy to discuss this? Sure. Um, uh, I first came to Georgia in 2008 to research with a friend of mine a, um, a cement project uh, that we were introduced to. And that resulted in our founding in uh, May of 2008, this entity that we call Kafkaz Cement, which is a holding for a variety of different um, companies. Uh, the first investment we made was in Yellow Sand. Uh, the next, uh, we ended up going into the concrete and small amounts of cement milling. And uh, then we ended up uh, acquiring a majority interest in a, the second largest cement producer in the country. And we put all these entities together, uh, sand, concrete, and cement, and that's what gives us our present profile. 
uh, we have uh, innovated. Um, there was a, um, uh, we had very old, uh, shall we put it charitably, um, and inefficient uh, Soviet era cement mills. And um, we wanted to come up with a quality product, uh, believing that the market in Georgia uh, had evolved in the direction of having higher and higher standards or demands for uh, quality building materials. And as a result, we decided to um, discontinue operating the inefficient mills and under an EBRD program, uh, which uh, also uh, involved, included a grant for energy efficiency, um, we put together uh, a financing facility through the Bank of Georgia. So Bank of Georgia administers the EBRD uh, program and uh, we get um, a grant assuming we meet the energy efficiency targets that uh, the new mill would permit. Uh, the mill itself, there were no real restrictions as to where to source it, and we purchased the mill from China. And uh, this project was started in 2014, construction started then, and completed in 2015. And um, we, the performance level of this facility was such that we qualified for pretty much the maximum grant that we could qualify from for EBRD. So you have various programs which dovetail both EBRD facilities, um, uh, sourcing of um, equipment for our different uh, sectors that we serve, but uh, no requirements as to specifically where because one of the other programs that's administered through uh, Bank of Georgia, which gives also interest subsidies, it's a program which calls for Invest in Georgia. And uh, so to get entrepreneurs to uh, increase uh, the size of their equipment base, increase efficiency, modernize old plants, this is a very effective way to do it. At the same time, they leave us free to pick what we view as the best equipment from wherever we can find it around the world. And um, uh, we've completed two of the three projects. The cement mill was completed. Uh, the uh, new batch plant was completed. And um, uh, many of its components came from Turkey as well. So uh, that was um, an important addition to our project. We've done other self-funded uh, investment projects with crushers and other such things, but that does not involve any kind of uh, it, it involves an international supply of equipment, does not involve uh, international sources of finance or IFIs. And you mentioned your involvement with China, and China recently has been exporting some of its surplus capacity in raw materials, like cement, to, to Central Asia and, and, and other surrounding regions. Has that affected Georgia at all and, and your business here? Uh, no, China, I mean, cement... Forgive the obvious statement, cement is heavy, cement is a commodity. Uh, you would not expect that uh, you could ship products large distances, except uh, especially overland. Uh, there have been cases, obviously, in history, such as uh, Nigeria quite a few decades ago, where, in fact, ships carrying a lot of cement would, would be backed up in the harbor there. So when you have an ocean-going situation, uh, by boat, that makes it more competitive. But uh, no, we haven't felt any uh, Chinese product come into the market here. Uh, there have, however, as a result of certain economic distortions due to uh, sanctions, uh, all of a sudden, a, a sudden rise in uh, imports into Georgia of Iranian uh, cement and clinker. Um, the cement can be either bagged or wholesaled, big bags, for instance. Um, and um, if you see, if one sees a major price difference in something that's delivered from Iran as opposed to something that's manufactured here, that would indicate that uh, there is some subsidy taking place somewhere along the line, or people are willing to give a deep discount in order to monetize their assets in a new market. So uh, we've seen some of that from uh, more neighboring countries, but not from China.
And how is that affecting your business here? Is that? Well, it's, um, it's interesting. Uh, we uh, formed, uh, we're one of the two founding companies of the Georgian Cement Association because we became aware of a rather large amounts of cement in bags labeled 42.5 and 432.5. And when you test what's in the bags, the, the strength of the product inside does not conform to what's on the label. It's, you know, it's not truth in advertising. And uh, the only reason that that happens is that people, wherever they get their clinker and millet, they um, uh, decide to change the proportions. So instead of having um, an MPA of 32.5, we've seen companies and bags that are labeled as 32.5 as low as 1.1, which is basically sand. And um, I went out, we, we do this sort of a double blind test. Uh, it's sort of, maybe that's the analogy with winemaking here, but we do a test where we have uh, the uh, Chamber of Commerce uh, of Georgia uh, go out in the marketplace and buy bags anonymously from time to time. Then we have the university receiving numbered samples, not identifying as to who the producer is, and then they perform the tests, and that way we have a very objective readout confirmed by our own testing, by testing of the other accredited laboratory here, Heidelberg, um, noting that, um, I mean, we've had situations where out of 30 samples, 22 failed. And uh, it's abysmal because, you know, this is an earthquake area and on a safety basis alone, you don't want to build something thinking that you've got the best cement when in fact it'll crumble. But even worse, it's basically taking money out of the consumer's product because if you think you're getting a buy because the price is 10 or 15 percent below either ours or Heidelberg's quality product, um, and you get something that has a performance level of 50 percent, 30 percent of what you thought you were buying, you're being cheated big time. And um, so what we've actually seen is that the rush to buy heavily discounted product, uh, some of which is uh, good as we've tested for ourselves, some of which is not so good, and to continue to cut prices um, and create a type of phony market situation, which in the long term is not going to help anybody in Georgia because uh, the quality producers will not go that way and uh, the consumers being cheated and basically exporting jobs to uh, other countries, not because they're going to provide an equivalent product, but because they're going to provide a product that's inferior but with a bigger margin. And uh, that's, I don't think that's where Georgia wants to go. And of course you have the Cement Association which is, is trying to give leverage to, to dealing with this issue? Are there other mechanisms and, and, and ways which you're trying to combat this, this, this problem? Well, obviously, um, the Georgia Cement Association, which is not what I would say one of your large, powerful NGOs. I mean, there's just right now two members with a, uh, but what we're very much uh, encouraged by is that uh, we just uh, have been conducting our most recent round of testing, and there are more conforming cements than ever before. Uh, it doesn't mean that uh, the companies that have had some cement score uh, within the parameters doesn't mean that they have changed completely, but at least it's encouraging to see that certain producers are do have in the market some quality cement. And uh, that makes for a level playing field, better um, customer relations, and if they on top of that, can buy uh, cement or clinker at a much lower price than even if they're competing for fairly in terms of formula, um, then they're still seeking a competitive advantage by a price of product, whether or not it's in the interest of the local market to be buying this. And I know originally, of course, you've got an American accent. You're not from Georgia. Has not from England either, in case you noticed. <laughs> I mean... 
Why, why do you have this interest in, in Georgia and why have you chosen to, to, to live here? Well, it's, um, I guess uh, you can blame family history and heredity on it. Um, I do have a uh, family that is Georgian, uh, some very close relations. Um, background is uh, largely Russian, but also Ukrainian, which uh, makes things interesting nowadays. But fundamentally, uh, my parents told me I was born in America, raised in America. I said, you're American, you were born here, you are raised here. You should be proud that you're an American, but you should also be equally proud with the heritages that you come from. And so it um, came about naturally when there was the opportunity to do some work uh, in Russia and Kazakhstan and Ukraine and, and uh, here in Georgia. How could I say no? But of course, you know, cement, oil, aluminum, all these are, don't have the same flavor as wine, so you have to smell the roses sometimes. And you obviously have a very eclectic set of interests, may that be wine producing, cement, art, lots of other things. Are there any sort of, any ways these things fit together? Well, I, th I think that um, the more eclectic one is, the more different angles or interests one can learn about. Um, some things are just neat little facts uh, to know, but then there's rather complex stories. I mean, history is rather complex, especially if you look in the Caucasus region. I mean, this is one of the most complicated bits on Earth, and it's so much fun. Uh, you know, I, I basically say I probably know this much when there's this much to, uh, to learn. But we're getting there one little step at a time. Somebody said it's like peeling an onion. It's a rather large onion, and sometimes it brings tears to your eyes. But uh, other times it's just um, terrific. And um, it's a really deep history. It's a really deep culture. And um, uh, if you look at the totality of what used to be the Soviet Union, uh, you know, how many countries uh, would have a I guess they had a commissar for nationalities, Joseph Stalin being the first one. Uh, but that's how important the issue is for this part of the world, is how do you deal with nationalities? And, and then that's what makes it, the texture is phenomenal. Uh, and, and, and on sort of a more, a more economic point, Georgia is trying to, trying to become a, both an economic hub and a transit corridor between East Asia and, and Europe. Do you think, given some of the internal problems and also encroachment by Russia, this is feasible? Well, I'm not a, I'm just a simple winemaker and businessman, and my point of view is that um, uh, I think every country has to do what it uh, needs to do in its own best self-interest, uh, given the situation, and try to have as harmonious a relationship as possible with its neighbors doesn't mean you have to agree with it. And I think uh, the current situation in Georgia, it is what it is. And uh, that is not stopping Georgia from wanting to develop uh, along certain um, uh, cultural lines, which um, uh, I would hope uh, ultimately are not incompatible with having good relations with all neighbors, uh, which is something I'm a great advocate of. I mean, here we have sort of um, maybe I'm encapsulating it in the Morani or trying to take the big picture and projecting it down to here, but I'd like this to be the Morani of peace and the city of love in a very dynamic country, and um, which is welcoming to all. And um, uh, I think that should be that kind of philosophy on a geopolitical level um, is also, I think, appropriate. It doesn't mean it's easy. It doesn't mean there aren't going to be issues to be resolved, but uh, nevertheless, got to give it a try. No, we, we, we've had a great time here, so thank you. And maybe on a sort of on a lighter on a lighter note, um, I know you've travelled you've travelled a lot throughout throughout your your years. Have you had a favourite a favourite place you've visited, and, and why? I guess I'll answer. That's a, actually a very short answer to uh, that question. Yes. And what about your experience in Antarctica? I saw, I saw a 
picture of that inside. Ah, uh, yes. Um, actually, that was the year I was in Atlanta, Georgia, Gridvik in South Georgia, Tbilisi and Signagi, Georgia. Haven't found North Georgia yet or East Georgia, but um, uh, yeah, that's part of it. I mean, it's going to the extremes of the world is very interesting to see. And um, again, well, let me just um, give you a little sorry. I mean, it's, it's very interesting to go to these places and travel, but one fellow who's writing a book uh, for the last 10 years has been writing a book on the uh, Russian Tsarevich's dog, a spaniel named Joy. And when my grandfather was in Yekaterinburg in uh, uh, July 1918, one of the things he found in uh, at that occasion was the spaniel that belonged to the Tsarevich. And so there's he did some writing about it in one of his books, and this young Russian's been writing a book about Joy, but just recently he said to me, you know, Joy's just a dog, a very nice dog with a tragic history, but what's, and this book started out being a story about Joy, but this book has actually turned into a story of the lives that, human lives that Joy's life touched, and what that, um, and all the texture and dimensions that that brings with it. And I would say the same thing with travel, the same thing was taking that photograph um, my son likes that picture of the uh, king penguin with that's his uh, chick, and he says, well, Dad, that's you and me. So uh, you can, um, it was a great experience, met some great people, I've met some people in the Antarctic who've been here picking grapes, and I just heard from again yesterday. Um, it's all about, as you go through, just like the way your travels are taking you, it's, uh, there's an intellectual quest, but then there's the human dimension, which gives it a lot more meaning ultimately. That's a great answer. And is there anything you want to add? Yes, actually, I do. Or ask me even. No, that, that would take too long. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what, what I will say is that uh, if uh, the way uh, this group of uh, inquiring young minds has started out traveling the way it has, I wish you both safe travels and many, many more questions to be asked and perhaps to be answered uh, wherever you are as you go from here on to Shanghai. And I think I've had people from every country that's on the road that you're traveling who have come here, so I don't even need to get in a car with you. I can have those same conversations right here. This is our Aleph. Do you know what an Aleph is? An Aleph is a letter from the Hebrew alphabet but there is a guy called, um, excuse me, a man by the name, an author by the name of uh, Bo Luis Borges, who's Argentine, who was blind. But he wrote a story called El Aleph, and the visualization is this man is in Buenos Aires, he falls down his basement stairs and he's wedged in a funny position and under the step he sees a point of light, and that point of light as he focuses on it, he's realized that he's seeing the point in space and time from which he can see all the other points of space and time. So maybe this Marani is an Aleph a la Borges, but maybe you have a movable Aleph, which is your Rubicon. So good luck with it.